anyways, we're going to get started. Thank you for coming to this super late workshop. Hopefully, I'll keep you awake the whole time. Uh, we're going to be using Photoshop. How many people have been using Photoshop? Good, because I'm going to be moving super fast. I apologize for people who are new to Photoshop. If you are, I do live streams. I do other workshops. I have YouTube videos where I slow down the process and uh, cover a lot of these things in greater length and detail. Yeah, we already have a question. Yes, I will be saying my shortcuts. Yeah, and I have a lot. I, all my shortcuts are going to be either on my, my left hand. I'm right-handed and my pen. I'm also using a tablet, so a lot of it's going to be tablet-centric. And the shortcuts are all going to be a Mac. So just do the translation in your head if you can. So since it's a big, big workshop, I'm going to try to speed through and get, start, and get started really quickly. But at the end, we'll do a lot of questions and answers. If you do have a question in the middle, don't be afraid to shoot your hand up. I'll try to get it really fast. Yeah. The question was when I'm going to finish. I think we're scheduled to go till 11.30. OK, yeah. All right, so a little bit about me. I'm Eric Proctor. Most people know me as Sao Shen. It's my pen name. I uh, studied traditional painting, actually, in university. I did a lot of oil painting. After I graduated, I was poor. I was eating beans on toast. Oil paints are expensive. I picked up digital painting because it saved me a lot of money, and it, it actually afforded me more opportunities for a career. So the, the primary tool I use is Photoshop. The workflow I'm going to show you today, I actually use in other programs too, like Sketchbook Pro. I have some tutorials for that as well. In the daytime, I work as a conceptual illustrator, kind of graphic designer. The stuff that you see in my gallery, the stuff that I'm selling in the merchant's hall, that's all stuff I do for fun at home. And I really love drawing fantasy, art, uh, lots of like cute themes and things like that. This is a piece I did with a, like a dragon mom and her little kids. Um, I also like to do a lot of fandom. I did this piece with uh, Stitch and Toothless. I like both these characters because they were made by my, my uh, hero, Chris Sanders. He designed both these characters. I'm also responsible for that grumpy cat Disney princess stuff. <laughs> that was my fault. Sorry. <laughs> and uh, recently got into Undertale, so you, I have lots of uh, Undertale fan art. I have it all at my booth, 511, if you want to see me tomorrow morning. Um, but yeah, aside from that, I do, like, I'm on DeviantArt mostly. I'm actually a community volunteer on DeviantArt, which means I'm a gallery director. I pick the daily deviations for the fan art category, but I also do a lot of outreach. So I, I try to put all my, my tools, I try to be very transparent about my process, and really try to help other artists grow. So I have the, the brush set that I'm going to be using in this Photoshop uh, demo. They're all available download. I'm not going to use anything different. You can just download all these brushes, use them, whatever, do whatever you want with them. You can alter them. Uh, give them to your friends, but I'll, I'll be explaining a lot of these brushes during this, uh, this, this workshop. So what we're going to be covering is the workshop uh, space, so Photoshop's tools, some of the shortcuts, and some of the things that I've been doing um, to make my workflow go a little bit faster. Then we're going to start talking about some line art, light and color. Then we're actually going to do some real digital painting. I'll show you how I do my detailing work and some of the background, and I'll try to leave about 10 minutes at the end so we can do some questions and answers. Yep. The question was, can we get the lights down just a little bit? No, we cannot. I'm sorry. OK, so let's go ahead and get started. So shoot. There we go. So right away, this is the finished drawing that, yes? Okay, so if they're asking me to just save your questions to the end, if we can. So what we're going to be working on is basically this little Bowser painting, and I'm going to basically deconstruct it and reconstruct it so you can kind of see what the process was to get to this point here. The first button I'm going to push in Photoshop is F. F takes me to full screen. The reason I like full screen is because now I can move this image off the canvas freely, and I can move my palettes into the empty space. F just means full screen. This, if you hit F again, it goes into pro mode where it hides all the palettes. Hit F again one more time, brings you back to the original. But F is my favorite, favorite mode to be in just because it gives me a little more uh, space and everything's unanchored. OK, the next tool that you see me using a lot is spacebar. Spacebar is the hand tool. A hand tool allows me to move that image around on the canvas. The next tool I use a lot, and you'll see it happen when I'm rendering, is holding down R. R is rotate. 
You can spin the canvas around, and this is especially great if you want to come in at an angle that is uncomfortable with you. You can actually rotate the canvas to the, the position that you want, come into that nice line, and then hit escape when you want to bring it back to uh, up is uh, north. The next tool I use a lot is the eraser tool. Eraser is just E. You hit E, it will bring you to eraser. The next tool is B, B for brush. B will bring up the brush palette, and if I right click on my pen, I have it toggled so that it brings up the entire brush menu again. This is the same brush set that you saw in the earlier image. And then V for move. Move is just moving the actual active layer. And then the other tool I'm going to be using a lot is the quick eyedropper tool. Quick eyedropper tool is just alt or option. What it'll do is when you have your active brush open, if you hit that alt and hold it down, you will actually bring up the eyedropper. And it is only active when you're holding the button down. So as soon as I let go, it brings it back to brush. So it's really great if I want to just pick this color and move over here, pick this color, move over here. Bottom of the hoop is the color that was, but top of the hoop is the color that is. So quickly, I'm going to explain just the layers real quick. Layers are essentially whatever the top, the top up here is the active layer. If it's all opaque, you can't see anything underneath it. Obviously, I have a million layers here because we're going through the workshop real quick. But uh, anything underneath will be shown underneath the active layer, and we'll get a little bit more into that in a bit. But what I want to do first is actually show you how I use that brush tool. So the brush I have active right now is actually a scratch brush. It's this brush right here. I don't know if you can see my cursor moving around, but it's the second box. The brush tool is kind of like a dry brush. For me, I made all these brushes to emulate brushes that I would use when I was oil, oil painting. So if I go ahead and use this, just kind of increase the size so you can see a little bit more, I can brush it down. Now, what's really nice about a tablet, and if you don't have one, and if you are getting into digital painting, please, please, please buy a tablet. Don't be killing yourself with the mouse and like, trying to get in there because one of the nice things about the tablet is that it will increase your workflow but it also has pressure sensitivity so that means the lighter I touch that lighter the color will be the harder I touch the more opaque it will be for some brushes it means it might get thicker and more opaque but that's essentially it but this is really important because this is how I blend so now I've had blue laid down here I'm gonna go up and go ahead and pick red and lightly touch from the other side and grow harder as I get towards blue now, there's only two active colors on this, this canvas aside from the white in the background, but with these two colors, I can actually go ahead and blend them. So if I take this light blue and lightly touch through the red, you'll see that it makes an overlapped color. And then I can select this color and then come back and go this way. So essentially what I can do is quickly blend between two colors with pressure sensitivity alone. And that's essentially all I do for blending. So it's that quick eyedropper tool. I'm selecting the color. Then I'm putting that color next to the color that I want. And then selecting between the colors where they overlapped. And selecting the new color that they created. And essentially, I can make a whole spectrum of color just from having opened the color selection tool twice. So let's go ahead and talk about how we're going to bring in our drawing. So a lot of people draw a draft digital or uh, traditionally. So I actually started this drawing that way just so we can cover this. So if you've, if you've decided like you're on the go or whatever and you drew a little whatever in a journal and you scanned him in your document and now he's in Photoshop, one of the problems is how do I color this now? Because if I color it, I can make a new layer above it and let's say I was going to color him in, but oh, I'm destroying all that line. I want to be able to put that color underneath the line art. So that means we need to separate the white and the black, because Photoshop doesn't know the difference of what you scanned. It just sees one same image. So what I do is I go to Channels, and I want to select this little hoop down at the bottom. What that's doing is it's selecting all the white in the composition. I'm going to go back to the main layers now with that selection active. Make a new layer. And then we're going to select the inverse because we don't actually want white. We want everything else. So that's all the grayscale. So we'll select the inverse of that. And I'm going to just go ahead and flood fill that in entire selection. And if I drop the scanned art layer, you'll see now that all that grayscale is retained. 
and I had essentially now have line art. So if I go ahead and say that I want to color underneath him at this point, you'll see that all the uh, grayscale is now maintained above it. Again, the two layers showing you that these, this color layer is now underneath the black and white layer. So it's a really quick way to have a sketch come in and you're retaining all the grayscale and you're able to go ahead and put the, uh, the colors underneath it. But what I really do is then I bring in the sketch layer and then I kind of improve the line art because what I don't want is any of this kind of rubbish that I've kind of put in here. So what I do is I go ahead and turn that opacity down and that opacity features up here at the top. I make a new layer above it, kind of zoom in and there's no real right or wrong way to do line art. Line art is all about patience, about skill, and about practice. But the, the brush I use for line arting is this first brush. It looks like an egg or an oval. And I just come in here and kind of just quickly put in the lines. But I'm not going to bore you with that. I'm going to pretend like I just did everything and <laughs> go ahead and show you what the line art looks like when I was cleaned up. All right, so that's a cleaned up version of the line art. So essentially I just took the sketch and just kind of traced my own drawing. So now what I want to do is I want to be able to build colors underneath it because I, I, what I, my style is to basically use the line art as a guide. I don't have line art in my final drawing because I kind of fold them in, but I want to be able to use it as a guide through the coloring process. So the way I do this is I create a mask underneath the, the line art layer. So I go ahead and I usually just pick gray, any color is fine, but I just kind of paint underneath this anywhere to where the, uh, the border is. Again, this is gonna take a long time. So let's go ahead and just cheat our way through that. Essentially what this is now is a mask. And what I'll do now is I'll kind of make a layer above it, and then I'm gonna hold the Option Alt button between these two layers, and as you can see, there's a little shortcut icon coming up. This is now wanting to create a um, clipping mask. And what a clipping mask is is basically says, okay, now I understand that the layer on top will only show up in the layer on the bottom. So really quickly, if I demo this, if I draw real sloppy on it, there we go. If I draw real sloppy on it, I'm going all over the place, but it's only showing up where that mask is. That helps me save time in the end because then I don't got to erase all that stuff on the outside. If I unclip this, you'll just see how horrible it is. <laughs> right. Right. So what I'm going to be doing is blocking the colors onto this layer, but we're going to take a quick break because I want to talk about uh, I want to talk about light and shadow, and I know everybody's probably seen I, I can't I got to wait to the end. Everybody's probably seen that sphere, you know the sphere that's like grayscale. It's got light coming in on one side, it's cast into shadow. Everybody seen that sphere? Good, because you're about to see it again. All right, so. Now, the reason they, that this sphere is shown so many times is because it is the fundamental. It really, really is. So what it's showing you here is that it's a simple object. It's just a sphere with the light source coming in in one direction. It's creating a highlight. It's creating a shadow core. It's casting shadow. And as the light hits the table or whatever surface it's on, it's reflecting that light back up at the object and creating a three-dimensional scene. Now the reason this is so important is because it is the fundamental of everything that you look at in reality. So that sphere is basically what's making up this mouth. So if you think about the mouth not as a muzzle and instead as two of those spheres in kind of a pinto bean shape, you're still going to apply the same very simple basic light and shadow across a, a, a more complex structure. So what we're seeing here is the same cast light core shadow and reflected light coming back on the other side. And you can get fancy, the nose itself will probably cast a shadow along the part of the muzzle. But again, the reason this sphere is so important is because it's so much to do with, with complex lighting. If you think about simple shapes, you can think about complex shapes. So going back to Bowser here, if we're thinking about what his, his shape is going to be, and I'll go ahead and switch to grayscale just so we can make the demonstration a little easier here. That cheek, that's kind of like that sphere, right? So I can kind of shade that in a little bit. That's already suggesting some of the, uh, the shadow there. And maybe the, the front part of the cheek is a little more in highlight. So quickly, let me uh, get a little smaller here. Quickly, I can make him come into form. You know, just by 
thinking about his, his body shape in simple structures. And the easiest way to do this is this chain chomp over here. That's definitely just a sphere, right? So again, he's gonna have that shadow core. He's gonna have that highlight. And he's gonna have that reflected light. And really quickly, we're putting him into form. Now I'm using grayscale just to, for demonstration purposes, just to simplify it, but that's really all light and shadow is. You're picking a light source, and I've decided to pick it from this side here. You're, cat, you're shining light across a complex form, but breaking it into part into simple shapes, and then just applying the same idea to it. So knowing this now, let's go ahead and drop some of these. I'm gonna keep that guide up. Kind of have a cheat palette here, but now that we know that, I'm gonna go ahead and start building his, uh, his, his colors basically in actual shape or an actual color here. I think his face is like orangey, I can't remember. I think his, his head is like green. So what I'm doing is I'm selecting that color, coming over, putting it where I think it's darkest, selecting the lighter color, coming over here and putting it where I think it's light. And same with the hair, I think it's darker on the left hand side and it would come into light more on the right. And again, I'm using that tactic where I'm picking between layers to block in the color. And I think his muzzle's yellow, if I remember correctly. I drew it, I should, rem I should know. All right. And then his horse. So quickly, I'm just color blocking, and I'm being sloppy with it because we're going to be doing detailing later. But again, I'm going to pause here again. Now, the, the palette that I have up is important because the way I select color, I have kind of a, a vibrancy to my style. So the, a lot of people ask me, why, how, well, how do you select the colors that you select? So the way I do it is I don't, you don't want to be thinking about color when you shade towards black. Because as you shade towards black, you're actually going to create a really, really murky drawing. So like, let's say that I chose this, this yellow color, right? And I'm going to rebuild this palette now. All right, so we've got that yellow. Now, and you see in my palette, I go from yellow to kind of like an orangey kind of a red color. Now, if I just kind of, I think the mistake a lot of people make is they're like, okay, well, I need it to be darker now. So they step it down, they go here, and they step it down, and they go here, and they step it down, and they just keep going towards, basically towards black. And essentially, you can see the difference now between my palette, which goes to a warm shade, and this palette, which goes towards a baby poop, so it, what it does is it deadens the drawing. If you go towards black or goes towards pure white, you're going to basically deaden your drawing. And the, the, the person who I think demonstrates the best is actually Jeremy Vickery. Jeremy Vickery is a, um, a lighting director for Pixar. He's essentially done exactly what I just demoed there. The top one is the baby poop. That's, that's the, the color values and intensity. Uh, the temperature is going towards black which has no temperature essentially, is it's a dead color. Whereas the bottom one is a color temperature that's going towards red, so all the shadows are going towards red. So it's giving you this vibrant uh, yellow and red based in intensity. So you can see his little render here of the Lego man. The top one with the render of the baby poop color kind of looks dead and a little lifeless. The bottom one using the red as the shadows has a lot more pop, has a lot more life. So when you're, when you're making a palette for your drawing, Think about color temperature, think about cool, think about reds, think about hot intensity and light, and try to stay away from shading things towards black, towards gray, and towards white. So let's step back to Bowser here. I am actually going to remove that because it's really gross. And to save some time, I'm gonna go ahead and cheat. So let's turn these off, bring back my lines. All right, so this is basically the same drawing, except I just went ahead and just blocked in all the colors. So what we have essentially right now is no different than what I was starting off with. I was just putting in, well, let me bring back my palette here. All right. I'm just putting in the colors and just kind of blocking them in where I think the shadows and the lights are. So at this point, I'm still creating layers as clipping masks, and I'm coming down and I'm, all I'm doing is basically saying, okay, well, now maybe this could be a little darker. So I bring it in, give him a little more depth in his hair. Maybe I want to give him a little more depth in his eyes. Or maybe I want to give him um, a little more shadow on his face. Essentially, that's all I'm doing. Uh, 
giving him a little more uh, detail at that point. Now, now I'm looking at him and I'm saying, okay, well, I've done a lot, but he still looks a little on the flat side. One great thing about Photoshop is it has this ability to do uh, really quick lights and shadows with the uh, layer adjustments. So if I create a new layer, I've made a new layer mask. I'm actually gonna come up here from normal. I'm gonna go down to overlay. Overlay is a really great um, uh, adjustment because what it does is it kind of takes whatever color you're on and then affects the colors underneath it in this like vibrant way. So you, what I use it for is creating really vibrant shadows and lights really quickly. So if I kind of choose maybe this creamy color here right on the edge of his face and uh, go to this big kind of airbrush that I have right here, I can kind of lightly touch the side of his, his face where the side where I think the light is and kind of bring a shadow or a highlight in really quickly. Now, this is a really easy way to overblow your drawing, so use it kind of sparingly. And in the opposite direction, I can actually use it to create shadows on the other side of his body. And as you can see, it's kind of burning it a little bit, so I'm gonna turn it just down slightly. But already, if I turn that layer off and on, you can see it's kind of giving it a light and shadow pretty quickly with little, very little effort. And again, I'm not gonna waste everyone's time. I'm gonna just See, I went ahead and did it. So that's basically the difference there with overlay and shadow and highlight and without. So now that I'm looking at it, I'm pretty happy with the way the light and shadow looks. But again, when we think back to that ball, there was that reflected light that came back and really made him pop. So we're going to add a little bit of backlighting. So backlighting is essentially choosing a light that's being cast from either the environment or from the ground or anywhere, and a third lighting source essentially. So I'm gonna say like, I, I generally like, like a blue color for the backlighting. So I'm gonna come in from the opposite direction of our main lighting source and just add a little, oh, let me go a little bit brighter. Add a little bit of highlight to him. Highlight his arm there, his foot, maybe a little bit on the chain chomp, his horn, a little bit more on his hot topic here. All right, cool. So as you can see, just adding that little bit really makes him kind of pop and stand out now. And again, I'm gonna jump ahead and that's where I ended up in the, uh, the drawing there. So now I'm pretty happy with what he's looking like. He's got nice, strong lights and shadows. He's got backlighting. I'm pretty happy and satisfied. At this point, what I wanna do is now fold that line art into the drawing. A lot of people will say, okay, well, I'm, I'm happy here. I, I have a line art style, that's fine. If you wanna go the next step and do like a really like soft digital painting, this is where I change the line art and it kind of disappears into the painting. And the, the easy way to do this is to actually go to your line art layer. So if I turn it off, you see it's like, oh, geez. Uh, because that's, he's def it's basically defining the edges still. But what we want is we don't want it to be black anymore. So I'm gonna basically make a new layer above the line art. I'm gonna make that clipping mask again because now what we're gonna do is we're gonna paint the line art. So to save myself time in the way I'm gonna fold that line art into the painting is I'm gonna select the colors that are very close to the lines and just paint the line. And as you can see, the line art is slowly disappearing. Now in some areas where like especially right here, I don't want it to be too bright and I don't want it to disappear either. So I might actually add a little bit darker color just so that when I go back and I'm kind of rendering in that detail, I can select from the darker areas. I can turn that, get the horn out of there and like the star kind of disappears. Now without the, the color on there, of course it goes back to black. Let me uh, go ahead and skip forward again. And that's essentially where I arrived once I was satisfied with the lines. So again, without the, the color on the line art, here's the line art, here's where the color is on the line art. Now, in a normal painting, that's basically just the three layers, the colored lines, the lines themselves, and then all of the stuff underneath. And I've got something still turned on here. There we go. There we go. All right, so everything that's not the line, the line art is like right there. Actually, it looks pretty cool. All right, so now I'm ready to commit and I'm ready to go ahead and start painting. So I do this because 
I don't like to backpedal. I, I, I just take all these three layers, I hit Command-E and merge them. A lot of people are like, oh no, I, I, maybe I want to back step, and maybe fix something. I can't. If I do that, I'm going to be tweaking and messing and kind of detailing forever. So I just go ahead and commit. So now this whole thing is on one layer. So now it's a, a matter of rendering. And it, this is where truly the digital painting comes in. What I do is essentially the same thing I did earlier. With a smaller brush, I just come in and I go ahead and start pulling that darker color in and making that line art disappear. Around the mouth, I might detail a little bit in here. And this is where you're really going to be doing all your detail work. These eyes are kind of like freaking me out a little bit. I'll add a little bit more dark in there. But again, like how I mentioned earlier, where there was a bit of a darker area in the hair, I'm going to actually just fold that in. Now what's really nice about the brush that I was talking about earlier, the scratch brush, is that it's really great for hair. You can kind of see how it's creating feathery tips. And that's just basically generating the hair for me with little effort. Right? And this is where I spend pretty much most of my time is just kind of detailing and whittling out little areas. It's basically bringing it into more and more form. So we don't have a lot of time. I'm going to go ahead and skip forward. So there he is when he's fully rendered. You know, that's basically just doing all I did, just a couple of hours of work, and then you're, uh, you're pretty much done. After that, you know, it's, it's really a matter of where I want to do detail work. A lot of times I'll go back and I'll, uh, I'll pick a smaller brush and maybe like his horns here, I might want to put little lines in and highlights and maybe more strands in his hair. But this is all here and there and detail work and again, we're saving time. So there he is with all his detail. So that's pretty much a finished and completed drawing, just doing the figure work. Now. Now I'm going to add a background. So let's go ahead and make a new layer. And I, I really work on like, like two layers. I don't want to destroy what I've done here with a figure, so I'm going to make a new layer behind him because the background's going to go behind him. I, wanted, I already went ahead and did a little palette here for the background. But you know what? I think because he's red and green, I think a blue background might look pretty good. And I'm going to go ahead and switch this. And then kind of, here's where my laptop starts dying, so forgive me if it starts freaking out a little bit. Now, remember all those brushes that I had in that palette that I wasn't using? <laughs> these are all my, my, my quick background brushes. So all of these brushes are essentially built to make things much easier for me. So let's go ahead and drop Bowser off the background real quick so I can demo this. But let's go ahead and say maybe there's, uh, there's grass down here. And it's not that gross color, it is this color. Just get a basic idea of where it is. Now, one of the easiest ways for me to make grass is to go back to this brush palette. And again, you can download these. You're welcome to use them. I use typically um, this weird shape here for grass because what it does is with uh, pressure sensitivity, if you're touching really light, it kind of makes a small, slight grass. And as you get harder and harder, it puts more and more texture in. So as you can see, I'm building very, very quickly, just a little bit of texture in this grass. And then I can also add uh, detail grass in the background there, or even uh, rocks. But these are all meant to save time. I could do clouds. and even trees. <coughs> yep, it's a tree just to make brushes. And stars. So really quickly, as you can see, I mean, it's a sloppy background, but I'm building a, a, a pretty fast background here. Just use these little tiny leaf brushes as grass. But these are all experimental. Like, you find what works best for you. Uh, like I said, my, my laptop's kind of getting angry with me. So I went ahead and kind of did the background already. <laughs> Drop our Bowser in there again. So yeah, all that stuff that you see in the background, that's essentially just how I, I those are all texture brushes. So it's the grass in the background. You can see I just used a tighter brush in the background here. 
these are all just leaves that I did and kind of faded out into the background. And all these trees were built with the texture brushes. It's actually this square brush right here. As you can see, it just does kind of a, a nice texture. But yeah, and then uh, like the stars in that, that, when I put the stars in the background, I just use the sparkles on this little star. And essentially, that's it. We built a, a, a figure. We brought him into light and shade. We used color temperature, detailing with the brushes that I had, put in a background, and I think we're pretty close to what the top, yep, okay. So basically, if I go ahead and merge these down, Photoshop has nice finishing effects. Uh, one of them is like, if you think that maybe there's too much red or whatever, you can go up to image. You can say, you know, you can mess with the uh, contrast or the uh, curves. Uh, but what I like to do is just go auto color or and there you go, Photoshop just said, okay, well you had too much red, so I knocked it down to blue. <laughs> so that's essentially it. Um, pretty much, any questions? Because I know that was super fast. Yes? The question is, am I using a laptop connected, or um, a tablet connected to a laptop? Yes, I am. I'm using a, uh, a tablet like this. It's just connected in this little, one little cord. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I guess questions need to come up here to the uh, the mic. Oh, okay. Yeah, it makes sense. Testing. Good. Here we go. A couple questions, actually. Um, yeah. You added detail to the eyes, like a, a bright reflection. When did you do that? Okay, so that was one of those detail things. Let me step back to it really quick. Okay, so here's where our layer was. The way I, the way I generally do eye shines is I grab this one ovally brush. I just grab, uh, usually just wipe, and just kind of mark it twice. Now I'm gonna double click that layer. And you'll see there's this outer glow. I usually change that to, in this color, in this palette, it's, it's pretty reddish, so I usually go to red. And then knock up the spread and the size a little bit. And what this is doing is it makes it look like the highlight's actually capturing some of his eye color. I, I realized I'm zoomed out, so let me show you what it looks like when it's off. So if I turn the preview off, you can see it's just the two white dots, essentially. I turn the preview back on, you can see it has that oh, wow. depth to it. So that's a really quick way to add like a little bit of depth to your eye shine instead of just having just like a white dot. So like you can even come in and touch the, uh, the back end of it to look like there's a little bit of reflection. But it's all, that's style. It's really just about style. But that's how I do it. And have you ever thought about taking your colored line work, throwing a black background on it and just selling it on a t-shirt? Just with a, a flat background? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, I have, I have some drawings where it's just a flat background, but most times I, I enjoy doing the backgrounds too, so I, that's generally what I do. OK, thanks. Yeah. Yeah, when you first started um, filling in the clipping mask with your colors, for this sample, you did it on a single layer. Mm -hmm. Now, personally, I tend to use different layers for the different colors that I use. Mm -hmm. But then, as I follow my line art, as you did, it follows very roughly. Mm -hmm. But so then I have a lot of trouble getting rid of the excess. Mm -hmm. So do you use an eraser? Or do you go, do you zoom in to deal with those tiny little details like the, uh, pointed hair, how do you deal with the very, very fine detail of the bleed out of the uh, color in your clip layer? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing. I used to draw with a much more particularly like fine detail. Like I would draw like this, like zoomed in like this. Nobody sees that but you. You know, so you're spending all this time manipulating pixels essentially. So try, to, try to keep your drawing zoomed out. Try to focus on the global parts. You know, if it's, if it's an, a real issue, if you see a lot of bleed through or something, fix it. But ask yourself how much of it is worth fiddling with tiny little details like that. Now, I, you said that you, you color on separate, like you do your colors on separate layers. That does introduce a lot of artifacts. 
I used to do the same thing. I would like yellows on one layer, red on one layer. You know, again, you're shuffling through lots of layers. Ask yourself what's most important when you're doing your workflow. Is it worth spending the time separating that because you want the ability to go back and change something? Or are you ready to try to like plow through it with a vision in mind and really just commit to do what you're doing. But again, don't try to try to zoom out a lot. Uh, thumbnailing is what it's called when you're zoomed out like this much. That way you're seeing the lighting at a more global level rather than hyper focusing on a little detail that no one will see but you, essentially. So as a personal suggestion, you would recommend to use a single layer for colors? That's what I do. My, my method is not the, the method everyone should use. I, I, like I said, I used to do it like you. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it saves so much time <laughs> to just kind of roll with one layer. And it helps so much with uh, global color and light because if you're kind of separating things, you're still thinking about them in separate ways in your mind. Like, and that's what I found. So it's kind of arrived at this point now where I'm on one layer. Okay. I try to think about it as a real, like an oil painting. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, so you mentioned thumbnailing right a little while ago. Mm -hmm. Do you use thumbnailing to figure out your initial composition? Yes. Yeah. So with thumbnailing, I, I usually just use like if I'm just drafting. I'm zoomed way, way, way out. Let me. I've got so many layers open in this that I'm just all over the place. You know, I usually just get black. I zoom way out. I uh, I get a really big brush because if it's too de detailed, then I'm like messing with it too much. And I mean, I'm really just. Really, just going for uh, you know shape. So I might, you know, I don't get any detail on there. You know, I'll come up and say, okay, well, that's good. I like the the angle there. Maybe that's the face he's looking up. Like you know, so I'm zoomed, zoomed way, way, way out. You know, because I don't want to get mixed up in the detail because it interrupts the flow a lot. Yeah, but yeah, sometimes I'm even more zoomed out. Yeah. And do you use other uh, layer adjustments such as um, multiply, color burn, vivid light? Yeah. I do. So overlay, multiply, they all do different things. Of course, you probably experimented with them. Uh, the way, the, what, what they're going to do for you is really going to be up to you. You know, so I use overlay a lot just because that's what I like. I also use multiply. Sometimes I use dodge. Um, but again, they all have different functions. Some of them have no function at all, like diffuse. I have no idea what that's for. Or scatter. Divide. Yeah. So, <laughs> like, but yeah, it, it, it really is an experimentation thing. Okay. And yeah. I have one last question. Mm -hmm. uh, when you use your traditional rendering method, do you ever use that for the background? Because you talk more about background using texture brushes. Do you right, use? right. So the reason I use a lot of texture brushes for the background is just to save some time. Now, if I am doing something where the background is very important and I'll maybe even over like it upstages the, the foreground, then I will use the same techniques that I used in the foreground in this demo for the background. Got it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, so you mentioned you have the... Uh, I'll have to close yeah. uh, You mentioned you have your brushes available for download. Um, mm -hmm. Would they be uh, able to be imported into another uh, art program besides Photoshop? So there are, there are some things you might have to do. There are tools online, like if you're in Sci or another program, you may have to use a converter or you bring them in as images. Um, but other people have had luck bringing them into other programs. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, and one other question. This is just sort of a personal kind of thing about your process. Um, I've noticed different habits with different artists. Um, at this point, with your experience, how often do you find yourself hitting undo? And I don't even, I don't know if this has to do with the um, style or the painting, you're sort of just, you're making the changes as you go, but I know a lot of artists um, with digital, one of the great parts about digital artwork is you can undo if something goes like catastrophically wrong. But for you, how much do you So how much am I undoing? Yeah. Um, so every drawing you see in my gallery represents hundreds of drawings. I mean, I'm undoing a lot. <laughs> yeah, so if it's in my gallery, it means it was a, a process of many, many drafts. If it's in the gallery at all, it means it made it. Um, you know, artists are particular. You know, you may lose steam on something and let it go. Uh, but yeah, you have to be able to be okay with not letting something go all the way. You know, even when I fall in love with the draft right away, I'll still make another. You know, just because I'll, I'll be like, okay, well, time to bank that one. I might like it and go on to it, but I might come up with something even better. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, I think you might be hard to find an artist who doesn't undo constantly, but I've tried to build it in my, my, my workflow that I'm 
not second guessing myself too much once I've established the composition and what I want to do. Yeah, it's usually in the composition stage where I'm spending a lot of time. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I guess, um, first and foremost, what version of Photoshop is being used? So I'm, I'm using CC. Uh, Photoshop CC is available for $10 a month. It just happens to be super cheap. It's nice to use. It has all the features that I need. But my brushes and all the workflow that you saw today, you can do all of this all the way back down to, I think, I'm going to say Photoshop 5. Okay. And yeah. in that similar vein, what are other tools or maybe even programs that you might recommend that are similar to Photoshop or where you can apply the same techniques? Um, I would recommend Sketchbook Pro because that's a really easy, I mean, it's super easy to use. Like, I, I find that, like, as far as Photoshop is concerned, it's very similar, but it has more of a painterly feel to it, so it emulates kind of traditional a little bit more, but all the fundamentals are there, and it's nice because you can use it on a mobile device, and it, I think it's free, too, so if you want to go ahead and download it and just give it a shot, you know, it doesn't, won't cost you anything. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hey. Uh, I have a question. Uh, as someone who struggles with making a good background, do you have any tips for making a background in terms of composition and just making it interesting in terms of color and things? So for backgrounds, they can be a lot of things, right? They can be a forest. They can be an ocean. They can be a modern building or infrastructure or whatever. But with backgrounds, one of the things you're going to have to focus on right away is the perspective. You know, so don't build your subject and background separately. Try to build them together because if you build your subject in one perspective and then go do your background in another, it's going to look really strange. One of the brushes that I have in my pack is actually just a perspective brush. It's this one down here. So if you tap the canvas with it once, I'm sorry, you'll see that it creates a, uh, a grid. So almost all of my, uh, my backgrounds, I'll put this in there first and then build it so that I, I know where the vanishing point is, I know where the perspective is. And then after that, it's all the same, right? Because a forest has the same kind of perspective you would expect in a cityscape. But that will help build the depth that you need in a background. That a lot of people, I think, when they don't build the perspective right away, their background kind of flattens the entire image out. So think about perspective. Think about how that's going to affect the depth in your drawing. Thank you. Yeah. Hey. hey. My question for you is, when you were tutorial, uh, tutorialing the sphere for the lighting concept, mm -hmm. you started doing your image just in grayscale. I've seen tutorials by other artists where they will do an entire image in the grayscale right. first. Would you recommend, as a learning process, only doing grayscale lighting before doing the coloring? And it's a good idea. Yeah. It is. Um, I don't, just simply because my background was in oil painting. and. It's not, yeah, it doesn't really, it doesn't connect. Um, I've tried to do it digitally. It's, it's really not my thing. I can't seem to get the vibrancy I want when I do a grayscale painting, so you might want to keep that in mind, but it's definitely something that's going to teach you a lot about lighting right away because color will not hide it. You know, so if it, if it looks right in grayscale, it's going to look right in color. Great. Right. And uh, if you were to do it in grayscale, how would you go about coloring that? If you yeah, I would pro so with a grayscale painting, you're going to use the, um, there's a, uh, a thing here where you can just go color, um, I, and I can't build it up really fast, but, oh, actually, maybe I can. Let me turn all this other stuff off. So, yeah, like maybe this little thing right here. If I make a new layer above it and then change this to color. I can actually build it into color. And you see how the, uh, the shading is maintained. But now it's red. Maybe it'll make the nose blue. Yeah. But yeah, it maintains all the shading. That's basically what they're doing. OK. Yeah. Well, thanks very much. Thanks yeah. for doing the panel. Yeah. Um, this is a pretty quick question. But okay. what was the command for the clipping mask again? Oh, for the clipping mask, it is. Um, you have to make a layer, and then it's Alt or Option, and then hover between the two layers, the top and bottom layer that you want it to occur, and then click between them, and it'll cre create the clipping mask. So you just hold down Alt on like Windows? Yeah, so I, yeah, it's, I think it's Alt on Windows. And then hover between the two layers. Here, it's going to unclip me. 
but if you click between the two layers, it just basically creates the clipping, clipping mask. All right, thank you. Right, and you can right click it too. And it'll create the uh, clipping mask. I can't seem to grab it, there we go. So it's also right here. This is to release it, and you can create it here too. Yep. Uh, hey, so as far as hardware, um, do you prefer a tablet with a screen, without? Is there a significant difference? Yeah. Okay, so I have three or four tablets. I have this one here, which is just a travel tablet, and it's great. I love it. I also have a larger version of it that I've used for 10 years. And then I finally bought a Cintiq, which is the tablet that's got the screen built into it. And at first I had some, I didn't, I, I was hostile to it because it's so expensive. A Cintiq can run anywhere between two and three thousand dollars. So you've got to be pretty serious about what you're doing before you jump to that. Um, having used all of them now, I have to say that if you're very, very serious about art and you've been using this and you want to step up, a Cintiq is the way to go. Um, and the reason I say this is just because it's back to, you're looking where your pen is touching so it's more intuitive, it feels more like traditional. That and you're pivoting from your elbow because when you're on your screen, you're gonna be drawing this way instead of like this. This is a tiny, tiny surface, so I'm gonna be pivoting from my, and this kind of chokes the line art a lot. So for drafting, composition, and line art, nothing beats the Cintiq, it's so good. Or you can use an iPad or any drawing surface that's kind of like that and get really smooth lines. This isn't bad, this is a great thing, and especially since it's probably like about 100 bucks, you know, it's a great tool. But like I said, if you're gonna, if you're very serious, or you got a Cintiq for free, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the way to go. <laughs> I was able to pick mine up on Craigslist. If you check, they're up there. When I checked, there was like four. Yeah, oh. people get them and they're like, I hate it. You know, you might find one for pretty cheap. Yeah. So you use it uh, vertically? So it's kind of like, it's, it's 24 inches and it basically is one of my monitors. And I just draw straight into the surface like this. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Hello. Hi. I think I'm too short. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, do you have any tips for anybody that does uh, skin, like painting skin and stuff like that? S for skin? Yeah, I have a really hard time with that. Oh, okay. Um, really depends on how detailed you want to be. And again, we're going to talk about color temperature because skin is one of those things that can look very dead very fast. So a lot of people will pay, pick like a skin tone and then start bringing it towards gray in order to shade it. And that's kind of create it like a corpse. Okay. So what you're gonna wanna do is, is think about when you're in shadow, like if the hair is casting shadow here, think about bringing it to a warmer color so that your character still feels alive. Mm -hmm. And then if you're getting closer and closer to a lot more detail, like even pores, I would pick up a texture brush. So a lot of these right here that you're seeing, those are actually skin textures. So like little dimples or pores and everything like that. And I don't know how detailed you're getting, but adding just a few of those things, a few things that make it look alive, will make it more relatable to people. If you have skin that's just flat and plastic, it's gonna come across that way. So if you give it a little freckle, a little bit of uh, texture, it'll make it look more alive. Okay, thank yeah. you. Hi. Hey. Uh, I have the biggest trouble with um, mainly like metal hard surface things, like okay. wall paneling. Right. That's right. always, I never feel like it's done. Okay, like yeah. So, so, yeah, metal's one of those things that's fun to just tinker with over and over and over because you've got a lot going on. You've got either texture or you've got specularity, you know, the, the, the gloss or whatever. And there's, there's ways to be like it's just way too glossy and it, like, it comes across wrong. So depending on the way you're doing metal, if you're doing like armor or if you're doing something that looks like it's weather beaten, think about downloading textures or using a texture. Um, some of these brushes that I have are actually for just metal. Like if I bring it over to Gray, you can see that this is let me release that clipping mask. You can see that that's creating just a, a little bit of a grain to it. Um, but if I contain it, you know, it could just be a little piece of metal. If I create a new layer above it, maybe set this one to overlay. Put a little bit of shadow in it. A little highlight. But you know, when you're when you're putting that on your metal structure, it's going to give it a little bit more believability when you've got texture in it. If it's something like 
polished, you're going to be relying heavily on reflections. Chrome yeah, yeah. So it depend like it really depends on whether or not it's weather worn, and whether or not it's like a precious metal or a gem or something like that. Because one's going to be relying on 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 tiny detail reflections instead of a global reflection, and the other is going to be relying heavily on specularity. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Hey. A few questions for you. Um, you work in more vibrant uh, illustrative coloring style. Mm -hmm. How would you, what would you recommend for someone who is more used to more natural lighting schemes? Okay, so like something more subdued, more, yeah. more. What you want to do is, so when I was doing a lot of oil painting, I did a lot of still life. So still life can't be as vibrant sometimes, I mean, unless you're painting straight from the tube. So what you want, what I did a lot is I actually set up still life. And I would use one, one image and then put different kinds of lights on it. Artificial light, real light, daylight, and then lights that had tints to them. You know, so that I can attune myself to the way that uh, those objects would interact with the different kinds of lights. But really what you're, what you're seeking is just palette. You know, like if you're going to, if you don't want a palette like mine, you're going to just go for a palette that's maybe more subdued or more earth tone or uh, something that comes from nature. Okay. I would really just take photos of a lot of things, pick out the, you know the colors that you want in that palette, and create palette blocks. You know for when you're doing your painting. That's essentially what I do. I just pick the more vibrant paint. Okay. Yeah. Um, another one is how do you determine detail density, and how do you overcome uh, value blindness? Like having a if you have a darker image uh, figure like in the foreground but a lighter background and like how do you overcome getting blind to uh, the details that you need in the darker image? Really, it's it's going to be a preference. But one of the nice things about Photoshop is that let's let's go back to a point where we had both the background and our figure. You know, already here, he's way too vibrant for the background. But Photoshop's really nice in that you can do a lot to knock out vibrancy with the tools at hand. Oop, whoa, going crazy there. <laughs> but as you can see, I'm just mo moving this grid. And it's already making him darker. Like the way he started off was like this. Now he looks like he's a little bit more in that nighttime scene. But there's a lot of things that are built in. Because Photoshop was originally a photo editing tool, so all of those things are still there. So you can mess with all the colors, the values, the tones with these tools. Curves is a really good one. Another one is uh, levels. That's actually going to just knock out the value only. I make him a little bit too vibrant, but you get the idea. But yeah, you can mess with all of that. It's destructive, of course, but if you're experimenting with something, if you've got, like you're saying, you're, you're having a hard time figuring out how to like bring the detail so that the background and the foreground need to match, those are really good utilities to do in Photoshop. And do you use the histogram at all for your uh, compositions uh, when you're picking colors? Oh, like the, the filters that they have? Yeah. Uh, well, in my older drawings, a lot of times I would like drop a filter on the last part of it just so that everything looked really nice. But at this point now, the colors are so vibrant in my, my palettes that when I do, it's like boom! It's, it's like neon, so I can't. But yeah, okay. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah. Uh, hello. Hey. I was wondering how you deal with color consistency when you're exporting the image or trying to display it somewhere like on the web or yeah. prepping it for print or something. Right, right, right. It really depends on what you're trying to do, right? So if you're, if you're going to print, you want to be in CMYK and CMYK is different than RGB and then everything is a little different. Like, so I know it sounds like high maintenance, but I usually have a second monitor. So the second monitor is showing me what it's going to look like on another color profile. So I'll move the image from one to another. And I usually do this when I when I think I'm going to go to print, or especially with the Cintiq. I love the Cintiq, but it has a terrible problem where it kind of makes all the colors a little more subdued than they actually are. So I'm constantly moving that drawing from the Cintiq over to the other monitor, and sometimes I even bring it in my laptop for a third profile, just to double check it in different places and kind of take an average of those things. But color calibration is very important, one of those things that you should probably do every six months or so and then making sure that you're profiling it on multiple monitors to make sure that you're getting the right colors that you want. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. <coughs> if that's uh, the end of the questions, I have, um, I do, like I said, I do have a, uh, a DeviantArt with lots of resources. Where am I? Uh, 
there we go. So, I, like I said, I do a lot of tutorials on DeviantArt. I will answer any question. If you ask me a question, I'll ask if you have something about this. I put all of the workshops that I do on YouTube. I also do live streams on Twitch. So if you have questions or anything, you can come to Twitch. It's kind of a jokey sort of edutainment sort of thing, but we generally take questions from the chat and uh, kind of slow it down for things. I know this was really fast and I covered a lot of topics really quickly, but come on up and take a card if you want. I'm also in the vendors hall tomorrow again, booth 511. Thank you very much for coming out.